It's the 15th of the month, which means it's time for another 15 minute quarter. Welcome back to uh, all of our longtime listeners. For you first time uh, viewers, we spend this time providing some updates over what's happened in the market over the last 90 days. We'll talk a little bit about what's happened over the last uh, nine months and provide some insight on to uh, our clients' portfolios and just provide some general education. I've got the official uniform of the 15-minute quarter on. Leslie suggested maybe we had a bow tie at one point. I don't know that I have the confidence to pull that off, but uh, we'll stick with this and, and hopefully it, it works well. We're calling this 15-minute quarter paying the risk premium. We'll talk a little bit about why we're calling it pay the risk premium at the end. We normally splice in information about strategy, throughout the market data. For this one, we're gonna cover the market data first, get all the red numbers out of the way, and then talk about the things that we're doing and why it's okay to be in the current environment that we're in. Because I think that's one of the things that we have been talking to our clients the most about over the last 90 days is the fact that, hey, we're six months in to a relatively volatile market. And there's a lot of economic data and a lot of economic news that are hitting the headlines. And as human beings, we're almost kind of pre, preordained to remember things in almost six month blocks. And so our most recent memories are of this market that has been in kind of a, a downturn since really the end of January. So we'll talk about why that's okay, why it happens, and how investors can kind of take advantage of that situation. Of course, before we get into all that, we do got to make sure that we cover the legal stuff. And so from a disclosure standpoint, uh, just want to point out that everything we're talking about is performance data from sources we believe to be accurate. It's not meant to replicate an actual portfolio. These are model indexes. They're not managed. They don't take fees into account. They don't take trading strategy into account. Um, and so take them with a grain of salt, right? These are for educational purposes. It's really the guardrails, the benchmarks so that you know what to expect when you open that third quarter statement. Uh, it's probably a little appropriate that the third quarter we're doing this update in October. I'm sure there's a Halloween joke in there about some of the numbers that we're going to talk about. I'll try and keep those cliches in my back pocket, not pull them out during this conversation. Uh, if we're still staring down this, this market in Q4, maybe we'll throw a Krampus joke in there for uh, Christmas sake. But again, disclosure wise, make sure the lawyers are happy. Hey, this is informational purposes only. We're not trying to suggest that any particular client do a particular thing. It's really educational. With that being said, let's kind of jump into what's happened over the last 90 days from a headline standpoint, because it actually started off fairly well, fairly positive. We were kind of going into a flat to slightly recovered market for the first two months back in July and August. Um, small caps were kind of making a resurgence from their market lows. And then we got to September. And all the other stuff came down, whether it was the Fed maintaining an aggressive stance to tamp down inflation, the fact that the U.S. dollar has gained significant strength against other currencies. Um, these all kind of play into the market environment that we're seeing. We live in a very interconnected world. And when something happens over in spot A, it has an impact on spot B. Interest rates, for example, are a great story when it comes to why is the market doing what it does? Because when interest rates come up, well, that means that we also have to discount the cash flows from the market at a higher rate, especially for those growth stocks, tech stocks, things of that nature. So those become fairly interest rate sensitive uh, investments. And at the same time, the market does have resiliency. And the Fed is finding out that some sectors are actually inflation resilient more than they thought. And so they're having to maintain this aggressive interest rate stance to try and come down on inflation. And those impacts are being felt across the market, not just here in the U.S., uh, but in the world as well. Because when we look at the U.S., surprisingly, if you were in the U.S. and listening to the U.S. news, you would think the sky is falling just in the United States. But if you go outside of the U.S. to international and emerging markets, they all performed almost twice as worse as the U.S. market. 
for the quarter, U.S. market down about 4.46, where we saw close to 10 and almost 11 and a half or just over 11 and a half on the international and emerging market side. When it comes to bonds, it's more of the same. If you've watched our second quarter and first quarter, we talked about the impact that rising rates have on the secondary value of bonds. And as interest rates come up, the secondary value of bonds goes down. Now, we've also talked in those quarters about some things that we can do to kind of mitigate that. And the fact that the number I'm showing you here, negative 4.75 for the U.S. bond market, that's if we took every single bond and kind of threw it into a bucket, mixed them up proportionately, that's the number that would come out. But not all bonds are created equal. And we don't want to use bonds on the long end of the curve, bonds that aren't coming due for 10 years or 20 years. Those are extremely interest rate sensitive. And we want to make sure that we have some exposure, but in our current environment, not that much. Whereas on the shorter end of the spectrum, we'll talk a little bit more about this in a couple minutes, but on the shorter end of the spectrum, we can mitigate some of that volatility. But the numbers are what they are. For Q3, it was more of what we saw in Q2, a highly volatile market due to inflation, due to the fact that we are in a rising interest rate environment that's kind of reverberated across the global equity markets and the global fixed income markets. So the next question, when we talk about those bonds, hey, if all bonds aren't created equal, well, what do we do in this current environment? And I'm highlighting right now the whole mix of bonds quarter to, uh, for the past quarter and year to date. And if you look up at the top part of that rectangle, you'll see that our bonds that aren't coming due for three months or a year, they have performed significantly better than those bonds at the bottom part of the chart that aren't coming due for 10 years or 15 years. And the great thing about bonds is we can kind of see that coming. We can look at the difference in yield between a short-term bond and a long-term bond and say, you know what? We're not getting compensated to be out there to have a bond that doesn't come due for 10 years. So why be there? So one way that we can help mitigate that interest rate risk is to be shorter, to be on the short end of the bond spectrum. That allows us to mitigate some of that volatility. And when we get to a future slide, it allows us to buy time because right now, when we're in this market condition, we are paying that risk premium. Any asset class that has the ability to be up by 20 plus percent in a given year has the ability to go down 20% plus in a given year. That doesn't mean it's a bad asset class. It just means that we need to make sure that we account for it appropriately when we build a total portfolio. So if we're wondering, hey, where should I be quarter and year to date? These are the numbers that we have to share. Uh, you can see year to date, most portfolios are significantly negative. Bear market territory, uh, the news would call it, at almost negative 21% for a 60-40 portfolio. That doesn't mean that every asset in the portfolio is down 20%. But again, if we mix everything into that bucket, then that's the number that's going to come out. We have the advantage of not having to mix everything in that bucket, though. We have the advantage of buying time. We'll get into more about how we do that in just a minute. But for the year, T-bills, short-term rates, those are probably the only safe haven right now. And that's one way that we can buy time. You can see T-bills came in at a positive half a percent. That's not going to do a whole lot for us long term, but certainly helps offset some of the market volatility that we've seen. So I've mentioned a couple times hey, we're paying this risk premium and we're buying time. Because at the end of the day, when we talk about how we pay for return, investors pay for return with time. And if you're one of our clients and you've had the misfortune of sitting in a review meeting with me where I've gone off on a tangent about market performance, you've probably seen this chart before. And this is a punch and numbers on a page. It only looks pretty to a guy like me, but I think it's really an ingenious way for our friends at Dimensional Fund Advisors 
to kind of illustrate performance over time. And the way you read this really kind of jumble of numbers is you can start at any given year, in this case, 2008, and go to any other year, 2015. And if you draw a line down from 2008 and over from 2015, it'll tell you the annualized rate of return for that portfolio over that period of time. So in my example, this pretend hypothetical 60-40 portfolio would have done 4.5% annualized per year, every year over that time period. But if you look at the numbers above that 4.5%, where you see 5.2 and 1.2 and negative 3 and negative 25%, that 4.5% is just an average of all that. It's not an every single year number. And so the reason why I illustrate that is because it, in, it shows you the value of, hey, when we go through a significantly negative year, 2008 is the most recent example. A 60-40 portfolio back then was down negative 25%. That doesn't make it a terrible portfolio. It's only a terrible portfolio if it's not lined up with your needs, because the way we pay for that four and a half percent rate of return over time is with time. And so we want to have assets in the portfolio that can support needs during these market downturns. That is what we use those short term bonds for, because they allow us to buy time. If you just held on to that portfolio and you could stomach your way through that negative 25%, you could see that about a year and a half later, you were already positive and going back even a couple more years, significantly positive. And that's why I love this chart, because as you move down the chart and move over to the left, what it really illustrates is the fact that time is our most valuable commodity when it comes to investing in the market, because the more time we're in it, the longer we have to go through these periods. And if we've got assets inside of our account that we can lean on, and this can come in a bunch of forms. It can come in the form of cash. It can come in the form of short-term bonds. It can come in the form of guaranteed income annuities. It can come in, in, in many, many different types of asset classes. But if we do a proper plan up front and know what our clients' needs are, we can plan for these types of market events navigate through them and buy some time to get that return. Because the box that's highlighted on the screen right now, that just shows time. And if you look at this portfolio, again, it's a pretend portfolio. It's a hypothetical portfolio. There's no fees involved or anything like that. But it does provide a fairly good benchmark, a fairly good uh, representation of what would happen. And you can see a lot of those numbers, five and a half, six percent, they kind of cluster together. There's some sevens in there, even a low eight. Right, but they kind of cluster together in that six to eight percent rate of return based purely on the fact that we've got time. So, one of the questions that has come up a lot over the last quarter for us is Is now a good time to get into the market? And my answer to that is always the same the best day to invest was yesterday. And we love yesterday because we know what happened. The problem is, yesterday's gone. We can't go back in time and invest yesterday. And so the second best answer is, as soon as we're able to make a market investment, which means we've taken into account our current situation, we've got assets that allow us to buy time in the market, that's the best time to invest. Because the longer we're in it, the higher the likelihood that we get a positive rate of return. Now, again, I, I really got to emphasize the fact that, hey, past performance, no guarantee of future results, right? We're not saying if you get in now, you're definitely going to get six to 8%. If I were to say that, the SEC would probably walk into our office tomorrow. That's not what I'm trying to say. All I'm saying though is the longer we're in it and the more discipline we have, we've got that currency to kind of buy that time. Hopefully you found this informative. If so, I'm Nick Brown. I'm one of the three partners here at Granite Harbor Advisors. Please feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions, if you have any concerns, or there is anything that you'd like to talk to us about. You can reach us through our website, graniteharbor.com. Uh, you can also call our office, 832-461-0789. Thank you so much for your time, and 
hope to see you again in Q4 with uh, a little bit more green numbers on the page.